Welcome to our Cranmer elections, Thomas Cranmer, as we devote series just to the study of him. We start with Gerald Bray, but let us begin with the citation of St. Paul. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? Who can lay any charge to God's elect? It is God who justifies. So we pick up here with Gerald Bray, the documents of the English Reformation, a few pages. There have been a number of important collections of Reformation documents in recent years, which have greatly enhanced scholarly knowledge of the period and given historians much broader access to the source materials. Among the important of those are these, G.R. Elton's Tudor Constitution, A.G. Dickens, The Reformation in England, J.P. Kenyon, The Stuart Constitution. But useful though these collections are to those interested in political or economic developments, they are of limited value to the theologian or the student of church history. Documents relating especially to the worship and doctrine of the church are only partially represented and are almost always abridged. Articles of religion and confessions of faith are either altogether omitted or given but a brief and cursory treatment. The result is that it's very difficult to follow the development of the church's theology even though this was one of the main factors in political and social developments. Finally, there's no collection of documents currently in print, which covers both the Reformation and the English Civil War period, although it's increasingly coming to be recognized that one cannot be understood without the other. With these needs in mind, the present collection has been compiled it endeavors to provide a reasonably complete selection of source materials covering the period from 1526, the date of the first printed edition of the New Testament in English, to 1700 when the Act of Settlement established the principle of the Protestant monarchy and the state in England. In selecting documents for inclusion, the emphasis has been on texts of a constitutional nature, those which represent the development of the church's doctrine and government during the period under consideration. Little attempt has been made to be partisan in the selection, and documents of a Catholic or Puritan persuasion have been included to illustrate the mind of the church as a whole. Readers interested in pursuing the course of dissent in greater detail are referred to the excellent collection of theological documents edited by Ian Murray, The Reformation of the Church, a collection of Reformed and Puritan documents on church issues, Banner of Truth, 1965. In addition to these documents, a few texts have been included which are seldom published nowadays and which are little known, though they are of considerable importance for understanding the doctrinal debates of the period. Examples are the 13 Articles of 1538, in which Archbishop Cranmer set out a response to the Lutheran Augsburg Confession of 1530 and the canons of the Synod of Dort, 1619, or more correctly, uh, which established the basis on which Calvinists and Arminians, or more correctly in the English context, anti-Calvinists, separated from one another in the period le leading up to the Civil War. There are also some documents in the King's Declaration of 1628 and the Epistle Dedicatory of the King James Authorized Version of 1611, which have been included for the benefit of readers who may not have the Book of Common Prayer or the Authorized Version of the Bible ready at hand. 
For this edition, spellings have been generally normalized according to British standards, but the grammar and vocabulary of the original texts have been left intact, with only marginal exceptions where it was felt that nothing of substance would be lost by updating the word, where non-technical words would be lost by updating where non-technical words would appear to have now fallen into disuse. An explanation of their meaning is given in parentheses. Important principle of this collection of English documents has been to publish all documents in full, which has inevitably led to the exclusion of material which is simply too long. In particular, the following documents had to be omitted. Number one, the institution of a Christian man, known as the Bishop's Book, which was published in 1537 as a commentary on the Ten Articles. It was reprinted by Bishop Charles Lloyd, Formulas of Faith, in 1825. And extracts may be found in Dickens and Carr. A facsimile was published in 1976 by Walter Johnson. The second document omitted a necessary doctrine and erudition for any Christian man, now known as the King's Book, which was published in 1543, as an answer to the Bishop's Book of 1537. Number four, the Books of Common Prayer issued in 1549. 1552, 1559, 1637, that would be the Scottish book, and 1662. The first two of these are published in every man's library. The first and second books of common prayer of King Edward VI. The third has been published by J. Booty, the 1559 edition. The Elizabethan prayer book, 1876 the Scottish Liturgy of 1637, and the making of the Scottish Psalter. And we will pick this up, God willing, in our next session. And there's going to be a little bit of a scramble going on as we're jumping around on some of the dates on Cranmer. We pick up with the influential Jasper Ridley's volume, Thomas Cranmer on chapter 13 in the fall of Oliver Cromwell. I'm sorry, wrong, Oliver Cromwell, 17th century. This is Thomas Cromwell. And we're late uh, in the 1530s. And he's already been through three wives. Jane has died in 1537 and given birth to Edward VI, the future king. And now they're in the game to get a fourth wife for Henry, Anne of Cleves. Anne of Cleves arrived at Dover on 29 December 1539. Cranmer and three bishops received her in the wind and sleet on Barham Down, three miles from Canterbury. With an escort consisting of neighboring gentlemen and Cranmer's own servants, whom he had hastily assembled in view of the breakdown of the official arrangements for Anne's reception. Cranmer accompanied Anne on her journey to Greenwich and was present at the meeting of the council on the evening of her arrival at which Henry, who had been disguised by Anne's, disgusted by Anne's physical features, announced that he had doubts as to the validity of marriage to Anne in view of Anne's pre-contract to Francis of Lorraine. The wedding was postponed for two days while the council reopened discussions the same evening with Harf and Olesleger, the envoys of Cleves, who repeated the assurance which they had given at Windsor in October that the engagement between Francis of Lorraine and Anne had amounted only to espousals and offered to obtain from Cleves a solemn declaration as to the absence of any pre-contract. 
The matter was then referred to Cranmer and Tunstall as canonists. Cranmer was not a canonist. We disagree with Jasper here. And they decided that it appeared from the statement of the envoys that there had been no pre-contract and no bar to Anne's marriage to Mrs. Anne of Cleves to King Henry. King Henry and Anne were married by Cranmer on 6 January 1540. Anne of Cleves was the third wife whom Mary, Henry married on the strength of a decision by Cranmer. First was Anne Boleyn. The second was Jane Seymour, and here's the third. And in her case, as in the case of Anne Boleyn, Cranmer was later obliged to rescind his original decision that the marriage was valid. On this occasion, Cranmer must have been fully aware of the implications of his decision and that a ruling that the marriage would be invalid after Anne's state reception in England would destroy all possibility of an alliance with the Lutherans and would also entail and involve the ruin of Thomas Cranmer, uh, Thomas Cromwell. As Cranmer supported Cromwell and the German alliance, it cannot have been necessary to subject him to the pressure which Cromwell applied to Henry and possibly to Tunstall, who was supposed to be Cromwell's chief rival for power. The decision of Cranmer and Tunstall was indisputably correct on the point of canon law. The issue was one of fact as to the nature of declarations which had been exchanged between Anne and Francis of Lorraine. On this point, the bishops chose to accept the assurances of the envoys of Cleves. Six months later, they chose not to accept them. Henry's marriage to Anne of Cleve raised the hopes of the German Lutherans for an improvement in religious doctrines in England. And John Frederick of Saxony wrote to both Henry and Cranmer on the matter on 10 May 1540. Cranmer replied to the elector in a letter that which was a eulogy of Henry. He compared Henry to Hercules, who had performed three great labors. He had expelled the papal authority from England. He had suppressed idolatry, a reference, no doubt, to the suppression of shrines. And he had destroyed the monasteries. If German Lutherans wish to criticize any of the doctrines in force in England, they should remember that Henry was the most wise and pious prince, had many wise and learned men to advise him. Perhaps Cranmer did not fully realize now what his wise and pious prince, the prince who had decreed the six articles, was preparing to do. But when Cranmer returned to Lambeth from his diocese in April for a new session of Parliament, the situation was very ominous. Gardner, Gardner and Tunstall had been readmitted to the council, from which they had been excluded at the end of 1539. And in his Lenten sermons at St. Paul's Cross, Gardner had attacked the Lutheran doctrine of justification, which, as Booser had pointed out, had survived the six articles and the attacks of the conservatives. Barnes's counterattack on Gardner had ended with Barnes, Jerome, and Cranmer's chaplain, Garrett, being compelled to make a public recantation at Paul's Cross, and they were imprisoned in the tower. On 10 April, the French ambassador Marillac wrote to Montmorency, the constable of France, that Cromwell was tottering for men who had sieged the loot of the monasteries were now about to destroy the doctors preaching who had incited them to looting. Hi, Mary. Good to have you back. Had a good time with the family in Michigan.
we've initiated this new series on Thomas Cranmer before we go to evening prayer. Cranmer and Cromwell, who do not know where they are, but eight days later, Cromwell was created Earl of Essex and Lord Great Chamberlain of England, and he struck at his most highly placed antagonists with unparalleled audacity. He sent Lord Lyle to the tower. That was a, a, a nemesis, a bugbear of Cranmer, on charge of treason for plotting to deliver Calais to the French. We'll pick that up next time. Again, we're jumping around a little on Cranmer. Now, Cranmer and the reform of worship and spirituality. Here we have an article with Brian Spinks, Treasures of the Old and New, a look at some of Thomas Cranmer's liturgical reforms. In an interview on Radio 4 during the Thomas Cranmer Quincentenary, the novelist P.D. James was invited to read her favorite prayer of Cranmer from the Book of Common Prayer. She chose the general thanksgiving, which is indeed a fine composition. However, to the historian and liturgist alike, it may be ironical that a prayer the excellent prose of which seems to have been the work of a Puritan bishop, Edward Reynolds, in 1661, and which seems to have been inspired by the Westminster Directory of 1644, should have been so readily assumed to be from the pen of Thomas Cranmer. Cranmer and the contents of the Book of Common Prayer, 1662, are very far from being synonymous. Such an observation might seem pedantic and donish, since almost any other prayer which the distinguished novelist might have chosen would stand a high probability have been from Cranmer's rights of 1549 and 1552. <clears throat> Yet even if Cranmer was wholly or mainly responsible for the production of these latter two rites, it is legitimate to speak of them as Cranmerian. It should not be forgotten that these liturgies were very far from being ex nihilo creations. Scholars such as Brighton and Ratcliffe and Cumming have reminded us that the compilation of the Books of Common Prayer in 1549 and 1552 Cranmer actually drew upon and brought together a vast number of sources and resources. There's some of the material afresh and anew. And he was able to put his literary stamp on the material as a whole. But he did directly and indirectly on a wide variety of traditional and contemporary liturgical and dogmatic sources, like the household commended by Jesus, Cranmer brought forth treasures old and new. This essay is going to look at generally the main principles which seem to be the basis of his method of liturgical composition. And we will then consider these more closely in relation to his rights for public baptism and the burial of the dead. We'll pick this up, God willing, in our next session. And now for Leslie Williams, emblem of faith untouched, short life of Thomas Cranmer. We are in chapter six, the Archbishop. And here's one of his prayers. Almighty and merciful God of thy bountiful goodness, keep us from all things that may hurt us, that we, being both ready in body and soul, may with free hearts accomplish those things that thou wouldst have done through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we pick up here, um, this is early, 1532-1533, he's made Archbishop 31. March, 1533. 
still on the road with the emperor. This is 1532 as an ambassador for Henry to the imperial court of Charles V on the continent. Cranmer received the letter from Henry in late October or early November 1532. When Archbishop Warham had died, Henry cast about among his trusted ecclesiastical leaders for a replacement and selected Cranmer to be appointed as the Archbishop of Canterbury. When he received the news, Cranmer was not happy. First, what was he going to do with his new wife? Clergy marriage was forbidden in England. Popular opinion would have accepted a mistress, but not a wife. He'd been married only four months and no doubt did not relish the idea of leaving Margaret on the continent. And when he returned home to a hornet's nest, apparently, he left her on the continent sending for her privately in 1534 and keeping her with him until the six, six articles of 1539 when he sent her secretly back to Germany for a time. And there was a great roundup of clergymen who had taken on, on wives in this period. It was a setback, actually. Then, too, Cranmer had gained a new perspective on the religious situation and had probably enjoyed being at arm's length from the hub of royal controversy. Further enmeshment in Henry's political and ecclesiastical administration could only spell trouble. Cranmer would have preferred a lesser position. He loved his studies, and he knew well the dangers and temptations of a public station. He said there was never a man who came more unwillingly to a bishopric than I. So Cranmer took his time getting back to England, thinking maybe Henry would pick someone else. Although an ice storm in France presented travel difficulties in December, Cranmer was an expert horseman and could have made the journey quickly if he had desired. Instead, he lingered and meandered, hoping the king would select someone else and forget about him. In the meantime, we'll pick that story up as we jump around a little in history. We're with Arthur Innes and Cranmer and the Reformation in England. The Hand of Cromwell, 1534 to 1540. He will lose his head in 1540. But Cranmer's already the Archbishop by 1534. The parliamentary measures of 1534 were chiefly devoted to confirming previous declarations with increased vigor. The submission of the clergy and the restraint of appeals were combined in one act. Moreover, according to the form of the act, the enforcement of the existing canons and constitutions was to be carried out at the peril of the clergy. And as much as it was left to them to prove that such ordinances were not contrary to the prerogative and public good, whereas the intention of the original submission clearly was that each one should be held valid until challenged specifically. The Annates Act was renewed, accompanied by a formal appropriation to the king of the right to make all appointments to bishoprics, abbeys, under the form of congliary, and the remaining pecuniary financial claims of Rome, not wiped out, thereby were abolished by this act against Peter's Pence. Bye-bye, money. The spring session concluded with the act of succession, because there's a little kid now by the name of Elizabeth, who's going on a year old in 1534. 
excluding Mary, who was born in 1516, and fixing the dynastic succession on the offspring of Anne Boleyn, Elizabeth I, being by this time some six to eight months old. The act was used to strike at two of the first men in the country, Sir Thomas More, whose European reputation ranked above that of any other Englishman living, and Bishop Rochester, Bishop Fisher of Rochester, whose fame for character and learning rendered him incomparably the most admirable representative of the clergy, never mind book burnings. He, like Warham, had misliked Henry's marriage with with Catherine, but had still more misliked the divorce and remarriage to Anne. His was the voice which had been the most boldly raised in defense of the ancient privileges of the Church of England. Almost, though not wholly, alone among the bishops, he had maintained the authority of Rome, just as Sir Thomas More did. We'll pick that up. Both Moore and Fisher will lose their heads because they oppose Henry. And now we pick up with uh, Dr. McCulloch, Chapter 7. We're jumping forward now to 1539 to 42. <clears throat> In seven, seven years later, 1559, Parliament passed the Article Act of Six Articles. And this is where Thomas Cranmer has already got a wife kind of hidden her away. He has seven or eight palaces. But now there's a setback. The alliance with the Lutherans is off. Anne Boleyn is dead. They've had the upset of Anne of Cleves. Cranmer's been a dutiful subject following Henry like a lapdog. And now... Henry's going to engage in the act of six articles. An abrupt change of religious direction whose motivation and development still to this day remain controversial. To understand this abrupt change and to see Cranmer's part in events, once more it will be impossible to, to avoid telling a wider story in which the Archbishop revealed himself almost as a powerless puppet, swept along in events beyond his control, and directed contrary to his hopes and wishes. The first hint of a new initiative came in early March 1539, when Thomas Cromwell made one of the habitual remembrances of, or lists of matters to be attended to, the first for three years. One of the items he noticed was a device in Parliament for the unity in religion. As yet, there was little public hint as to what shape that unity might take. When the former English-Swiss exchange students with Zurich wrote to their heroes in Zurich, at much the same time as Cromwell was pondering his parliamentary agenda, there were cautiously they were cautiously optimistic about the future of reform in England. Thanks to the royal proclamation of 26 February, traditional ceremonies were provided with didactic explanation to justify them. And there was still no decision on the relaxation of compulsory clerical celibacy. Indeed, quote, there are those who have verily, very freely preached before the king on the subject, closed quote. Only a few months after the death of John Lambert, a man who did not believe in the bone munchy crunchers, and who... Cranmer would follow, but also a man against whom Cranmer 
was a participant and an accessory to first-degree homicide. His name is John Lambert, a name not to be forgotten. John Lambert, the view of these evangelicals such as him was that the Mass is not declared to be a sacrifice for the living and dead, but is a representation of his passion, a sign and a seal or a sermon, not a transmutation or transubstantiation or consubstantiation or ubiquity. Philip Melanchthon, however, had his doubts about the progress in England expressed at first only obliquely in a letter to Henry, but much more vocally in an accompanying letter to Thomas Cranmer. He bitterly castigated Henry's proclamations in November 1538 and 1539 on religion, expressing himself with particular force about February's explanation of ceremonies, which he assumed were a sophistical plot by Gardner and Stokesley. Philip Melanchthon understood Gardner's craftiness. In April, he wrote once more to Henry, this time presuming on the king's known admiration for him in a full critique of the November proclamation. We will pick that him up tomorrow. We're now in Thomas Cranmer, but a bunch of essays edited by Margot Johnson on the worthy communicant, chapter seven. And this presupposes a larger uh, perspective here. Within the year of the death of King Henry VIII, within that December 1547, he's still alive at that point, an act of parliament that on the first day of May in the following year, no one shall, by word or otherwise, deprave, condemn, despise, or revile the sacrament. The act then goes on to require that the sacrament should be ministered to all Christian people under both kinds. That's a development. The Lutherans wanted that piece. Bone muncher cruncher funny. It's true. They're cannibals. They eat bones, elbows, kneecaps, toenails, hair, teeth, beards. Now they say I'm crude and irreverent, but let them own it. They talk about eating body and drinking blood and swilling the blood over the tongue and through the teeth and over the gums and drinking blood. Anyways, back to it. So this new act allows for both the communion of the cup and the wafer. The connection between these two parts of the act is not immediately obvious. It was certainly not the intention that there should be a free-for-all and a general license for unlimited blasphemy for the next six months. A separate royal proclamation had closed that loophole. Rather, it was con confidently anticipated by May 1538 that the form of the sacrament would have been publicly and officially declared. Now, Henry is dead by May 1548, and Edward is on the throne as a young boy. After this, there would be no place for dissent or contradiction, as indeed there was no place for it now. The sequel suggests that both the theology of the sacrament as well as the manner of administration had already been decided. Henceforth, the sacrament of the altar was to be theologically and liturgically a no-go area. There was no more discussion, pamphleteering, or controversial preaching. The administration of the sacrament under both kinds and to all people and the consequences of this decision had been made are no longer negotiable. This act may be taken to mark the beginning of the process which culminated in the passing of the act of uniformity in January 1549. 
1549, and the publication of the first prayer book of King Edward VI some six months later. The Reformation of the Eucharist was the priority within the larger scheme of the total reformation of the worship of the English church, which is arguably Thomas Cranmer's greatest achievement and indisputably his most influential. We'll pick that up in our next go to. Hello, Rocchio Priestley. God bless you too. Now we're with my former professor of New Testament, Dr. Philip Edgecombe Hughes on the theology of the English Reformation and the English Reformers. Chapter 4 on preaching and worship. Of course, the prayer book's part of that. Prior to the Reformation, preaching had fallen into such neglect that it virtually ceased to function in the church. <clears throat> this was due to the widespread ignorance, laziness, and general dissoluteness of the clergy, encouraged by the all-too-common failure of the bishops to exercise due oversight in the diocese for which they had accepted responsibility. Frequently, indeed, clergy and bishops were unknown to the people because of, instead of living among their people, they were absentees from their parishes and dioceses. Ecclesiastical titles and preferments could be procured through influence or purchased with money without any thought of being given to the souls of the people and their need for the gospel. Inevitably, this state of affairs led to the eclipse of preaching. No less inevitably, however, the rediscovery of the word of God involved the rediscovery of the necessity of preaching. Christ himself was a tireless preacher and he had commissioned his followers to preach the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. It was plain to the reformers as they read the New Testament that preaching had been the primary function of the apostles, just as Paul said in his epistle to the Corinthians, that Christ had sent him not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians 1.17 and it was plain to them that the reinstitution of the apostolic office of preaching was essential if the church of their day was to be renewed. Accordingly, we find themselves to be constant preachers in the English Reformation, diligently laboring to restore preaching to its proper prominence in the 10,000 parishes of the Church of England. A church that ceased to preach or that preaches error contrary to scripture has ceased to function as a true church of Christ. Hence, Article 19 of the 39 Articles designates the preaching of the pure word of God as a distinguishing mark of the Church of Christ. When, in 1550 or 51, the year's uncertain, John Jewell took his degree of Bachelor of Divinity, he preached a sermon in St. Mary's Oxford University on the text, If any man speak, let him speak after the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4, 11 in which he insisted before his very learned academic audience that a pastor should speak often and also that what he says should be taken directly from the Holy Scriptures. And we'll pick this up in our next series on Thomas Cranmer. We say with St. Paul, if God be for us, who elect? It is God who justifies. I am convinced that nothing but nothing can separate us from the love of God. <laughs>
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Here ends this session. Evening prayer shortly. Good to have you. Mary, Mario, and Rocchio or Rocchio. I'm not sure how to say it. Just call me Phil. I'm not into titles um, unless you feel the need. But until next time, Godspeed. <laughs>